90s aid on our message board over at WrestlingRoundTable.com posted earlier tonight this. Okay, I got a ton of lip for it, but I decided to stay behind last minute for the radio show instead of heading to the drive-in. Drive-in? They still have those? Anyway. Boy, were they pissed. I stay behind to enjoy wrestling for three days in a long while, and they're telling me that wrestling is now running my life. It's annoying as hell that they're trying to make me feel bad about this. Make this show count, guys. Well, hope we can live up to your expectations. Welcome back to Wrestling Roundtable Radio. I'm the host, Eric Santa Maria. Been working in wrestling almost seven years. This year, I edited, produced, slash directed my first documentary, Wrestling Road Diaries. A few weeks ago, I was co-hosting the pre-show with Kevin Kelly in New York for Ring of Honor's Most Viewed Show Ever. And I also just recently did ring announcing for Ring of Honor in Richmond, Virginia, in Charlotte, North Carolina. So, excuse me for not updating WrestlingRoundTable.com as much as I should, but if you went on the website today, you'll see that it was indeed updated. Yes, huge news update, new polls, our latest shows, even an exclusive match from Gateway Championship Wrestling back in January 2002. Delirious, just starting out in his career against a guy you might see on Monday nights named Evan Bourne. Of course, back then, he was Matt Seidel. So, get to see these two in the early stages of their career. An exclusive match presented by Wrestling Roundtable. And, also exclusive to Wrestling Roundtable, in addition to the number 52 show, which looked back at Edge's career and we remembered Macho Man Randy Savage, Some of the latest radio shows as well, which are available here on blogtalkradio.com, iTunes, if you go in the search box, type Wrestling Roundtable, or go to WrestlingRoundtablePodcast.com. We're also simulcast on GoFight Live, and you can simulcast this show as well. You can get the player embedding code in our profile page over at Blog Talk. Now, of all the times I plug this stuff, there's a reason for it, because... A lot of work goes into this. A lot of work, a lot of energy, a lot of money. (laughs) And this is a fan-driven show. The content and the sharing is on the fans' half. Yes, we have industry professionals. Yes, we've got fans. We've got people from all walks of life. And that's what I like about the Wrestling Roundtable, whether you're a fan of mixed martial arts or pro wrestling. If you've been watching a year, 10 years, 20 years, a day, whatever style or preference you have, there should be something for everybody. And you know what? If there isn't, Speak up. Voice your opinion, because that's the idea here. You are part of the show. And in that spirit, that's why I wanted to say specifically, before I introduce the panel, to Corey. Corey Ender Ake is our radio panelist from Chicago. Hey, Corey. Hey, Eric. Hello, everyone. Corey, you get a lot of shit from the fans, even the fellow panelists here at the roundtable. And I can't say I'm... Not guilty of that either. I mean, I did call you batshit on the air once. (laughs) But there's a reason you're on the panel. And that is because you love this show. Because even more so than a lot of people who have been on front of our camera on the panel itself and our video shows, you are such a fan of the show. You tweet about the show. You post about the show. You're on our message board. You're always promoting the show. You believe in the show. And that enthusiasm was just so incredible and so admirable that I had to give you a spot as our special radio panelist because you know what? I disagree with pretty much 90% of what you say, (laughs) but we can't all be agreeing all the time, right? It's got to have a different perspective. It's got to have different people on board. And I know you get upset about some of the things people say, but believe me, you've earned your spot. And I wish there were a lot more people like you, so I just wanted to take the time to say thank you for coming on the show as often as you do. Thank you. I I really appreciate it. And I do consider it an honor to still be a part of the show. I've read all of the YouTube comments because your voices do not go unheard. And I do get discouraged at some of the things people say about my commentary. So I, I really appreciate that you still put up with me, Eric. I consider that an honor. (laughs) <laughs> well, thanks a lot, and we hope to hear more of that opinion a little later on, but speaking of the panel, I want to introduce someone who has been on the panel from pretty much the very beginning. 
and haven't seen him too often lately, unfortunately, but he's come back on. Chris Harris. Hello, Chris. Hey, yo. How have you been, Chris? Lost some more weight? <laughs> yeah, I'm down to a cool 95 pounds these days. <laughs> Got to be careful when the wind blows, you know. <laughs> well, you do a lot of running around New York City for your job, burning a lot of calories. I- I do. I'm glad to be back. I just want to give a quick shout-out to one of our fans. I hope he's listening tonight, Timothy Miles. He sent me a, a message the other day, and he said he hopes to see me back soon, and I hope he's listening to I'm back. All right, cool. Also, some of our regulars, someone who also started out as a fan and got invited on the show, because, like I said, that's what it's all about, and has shown a lot of enthusiasm, Will Brooks. Hello, Will. Hello, Eric. And everybody out there who's watching the Battle of the Wills, it's a great show, and I'm kicking the shit out of TLD, and it's very pleasurable on my end. (laughs) Yes, the Battle of the Wills, a new segment we just debuted last week, in which Will Brooks and Will Vafita, as the other Will on the show, battle it out, as the title implies, on making their picks for pay-per-view events. The first show they did was on Money in the Bank, and we will get the results of that later on, but the brainchild of this concept, at least as far as it was presented to me, Will Vafides is also on our line, also known as Tommy Lee Danger. I don't think you've ever specified what the TLD actually stood for, but there you go, the wrestling name TLD. Hello, Vafides. Which is why it's TLD, and that's why you go to TLDWrestling.com. Now you ruined it. Now I can't get any hits. Uh, hello, everybody. It's lovely to be back here. I got my water down here because it's going to be a long show, and we're going to have a good time. And I got to ask, Eric, how does it feel to know that a Money in the Bank winner, and just a couple of years ago you filmed him doing independent stuff? I got to ask, how does that make you feel? I really don't think much of it because the thing is, I don't really get starstruck too much in wrestling anymore outside of people like a Hulk Hogan or one of those sort of bigger names. Call it complacency on my part. Maybe I should feel more special about it. I mean, last time we were on the air, and it's been a little while. Like I said, I've been real busy in the past month doing a lot of stuff in wrestling, too. But one of those things was co-hosting with Kevin Kelly. And last time, Rodney and I were talking about how, wow, we were just watching this guy several years ago in your room interviewing The Rock, and now here I am. So moments like that do make me have some pause. So now that you put it that way, it's pretty cool. But I've also known... Daniel Bryan so long <laughs> that it's just he's just Bryan to me so you know what the more famous he gets the better it is for Road Diaries so I think it's pretty cool <laughs> last on our panel Rodney LeCant hey yo Rod hey yo Eric what is going on I just walked in my house five minutes ago like you Eric I've been having busy days busy doing what drinking yeah <laughs> Celebrating the birthday, I have a lot of production stuff going on. I did a wedding and a music video two weekends in a row. We're keeping busy, Eric. So are we going to talk about MMA tonight? Let's do it. <laughs> You're such a motherfucker, I swear. Because <laughs> every goddamn show, we're all waiting in the queue going over what we're going to talk about, and then it's like 10.59, maybe, and Rodney calls in. <laughs> you drive me nuts. Oh, man, well, I didn't know you guys had a whole show preparation thing. Usually when I get on early, we're talking about girls or some shit. <laughs> <laughs> We've only been doing this show a year, Rod. This is the 31st radio show. You haven't caught on to how it runs yet? No, apparently not. Uh, all right, well... We definitely have caught on to mixed martial arts, and I know a lot of our fans are like, ah, we don't want to hear the MMA stuff. We want to get to pro wrestling, especially now that CM Punk is the big thing and wrestling is, well, I don't even want to say wrestling because it's more WWE, is uh, getting some momentum lately. But let's get into that a little more, Rob. Last time time we talked about mixed martial arts, we were in the midst of all these Zufa productions in a row. So many UFC shows in a row, and, and now that Strike Force is under the Zufa banner, you got to throw that in the mix too. So many shows, you get, it's hard to keep track of them. But I want to start off at UFC 131, and that one, if you remember, Rodney had Kenny yeah. Florian's featherweight debut. He got the unanimous decision over Diego Nunez, and with that victory, Dana White's saying he's in line for a title shot against Jose Aldo. 
Now, I'm a Kenny Florian fan, but one victory, and it wasn't even the most spectacular one nonetheless, over Diego Nunez in his featherweight, in his division debut, and he's jumped the line pretty much to get a shot against Jose Aldo. I don't know how I feel about that one. What What do you think about that and the fight against Nunez? I could see a point where Dana White is coming from. I mean, after the Mark Hominick fight, I mean, I think featherweight was starting to lose a lot of names. Uh, especially after your right favor went down. So they were desperate for a big name, especially since not a lot of people know who Jose Aldo is, mm-hmm. and it's really hard for him with the language barrier to really become a star on his own. So, and Kenny Floyd, I think they really wanted to see how he cut the weight. I mean, I thought he looked pretty small at 155. I didn't even yeah. think he was going to make the cut, but, yeah, he made the weight. He was smart about it. And he honestly looked very good. I mean, Diego Nunez is, he only had like one or two losses uh, before that. It was a close fight, but I think Kenny Floyd got the majority of it. And if I was the UFC, I would throw that in there. You don't want to risk Kenny Floyd losing and not getting that title fight, which is the whole point of him going down to the weight class anyway. But don't you think more so than Florian you would think that the next featherweight title bout would be a rematch against Mark Hominick? No, I don't think it would be a rematch. Not a mean rematch. I think Chad Mendes was the perfect fight after that, but that didn't go down. But, uh, no, I mean, a part of me did want to see Hominick win just because I like underdogs, but uh, I don't think that fight was close enough for people calling for a rematch. Well, that fifth round sure looked like it. <laughs> the Floyd Jose Aldo match was the right match to make. Think about back... In 2007, Eric, when Quinn Jackson got at the UFC, and then he beat Marvin Eastman, and all of a sudden he's get put against Chuck Liddell. I mean, maybe the light heavyweight division wasn't, I guess the stars weren't as evolved as they are now, but that was in the middle of Chuck Liddell's hottest streak. And then mm-hmm. to put a guy who a lot of American fans probably didn't know, he beat a fight that a lot of people never knew about, and then he's put against Chuck Liddell Memorial Day weekend. So, and look what happened to his stardom there. So, I think it's a good call by the UFC. Speaking of calls, I wanted to give out the number to call. It is three four seven eight five seven four six four seven. Share your thoughts and opinions. Where's Ryan from Massachusetts? <laughs> Whenever we talk about UFC, I think maybe I'll put him on, but I haven't seen him in a while. Anyway, moving on. Last time we talked about the addition of five round main events for every UFC main event after 133 and that really came to light here in my mind in the main event of 131 when Junior Dos Santos defeated Shane Carwin by unanimous decision because if that had gone a few more rounds I don't know Rod Shane (laughs) Carwin looked real good he obviously trimmed up a lot I think his cardio is vastly improved because as opposed to the first round knockout master we saw who was undefeated up until he fought Brock Lesnar and seriously gassed out as was visibly obvious in the second round of that fight last year. Yeah. This guy went the distance the first time in his career and holy shit, if there were a few more seconds on that guillotine, maybe Junior Dos Santos wouldn't be the number one contender today. I as disagree. It, Oh, really? Okay. I I, I disagree. I think another round, Junior Santos would have really kicked in. I think he was just way too fast for Shane Carr, he would have been more prepared for championship rounds. Okay, well, that being said, yes. Dos Santos came within a hair of winning in the first round by TKO. Yeah. He looked great doing it. In fact, looking up at Herb Dean, he's like, are you going to end it? I'm just pounding this guy's head in. I don't know if I would have been surprised. But that being said, oh, man. Maybe it's just because I'm a sucker for guillotines and close calls. But, man, that was real close right at the end of that third round, you have to admit. You know what's scary about that, Eric? What if we saw what Shane Curran did to Brock? What if that was Brock? How hard would your heart be beating? Yeah. That's the scary. Like, that Junior Santos came for, if he did it to Carwin, I was never too confident in Brock winning that fight. I'm almost thankful that it didn't happen. The potential fight with Dos Santos, you mean? Yeah. Well, as it is, it's going to be Dos Santos and Cain Velasquez. Originally, it was rumored or scheduled to be UFC 138. That is now going to be airing on Spike on tape delay from England. 
and it seems as if it's still going to happen in November at UFC 139, however. So yeah. any thoughts on the real fucking heavyweight showdown between JDS and Velasquez? I just hope that nobody gets hurt. I mean, right now we're really going into an era or a few months of, like, really, like, good cards. I mean, we're heading to the fourth quarter, so I feel like a lot of these money fights create the first few months of the year, and then we kind of went lesser stars, and now it's like all the stars are ending the year. So with this fight, hi, it's it's tough to say, Eric. The two best heavyweights in the world. I could see Junior Santos winning. Okay. Well, you mentioned two of the best heavyweights in the world. I don't know if you saw, Rod, especially because the news was just updated on WrestlingRoundTable.com that you don't read. (laughs) But the Strikeforce heavyweight champion, Alistair Overeem, was taken out of the heavyweight tournament. Did you see that? Yes, I did, and I I read about that. That, that to me, almost defeats the whole purpose of the Grand Prix. The Grand Prix, what I thought was going to be a great way to show Alvin Osteen that he is the real heavyweight champion that he could beat these guys, although he's going to win, and that's the guy people wanted to see come over to UFC to fight their top heavyweights. But now they're big stars out of the tournament, so I really hope this whole thing goes well for them. With Fader losing first round and now your heavyweight champion to injured, they're probably like, what the fuck is this? I'd be pissed. Well, Dana White seemed to be kind of sarcastic about, well, we'll wait till his pinky toes healed up. Overeem said that he had a broken toe and he wanted to wait another month they wanted him to fight on September 12th they being strike force and when he pretty much turned it down they took him out of the tournament he's still under contract he might have one more fight left on that contract so some people are thinking that this is just posturing for a UFC deal because as we talked about last time Rod he had his sights set on going to UFC now yeah. that that being said don't you think if it was John Jones <laughs> with his broken finger or whatever it might have been, he, Dana White would have been a little less annoyed with him? Maybe that's just one part of it. But in the grand scheme of things, ever since that first night in Izod Rod, this heavyweight tournament's really taken a downturn, don't you think? It has, marketing-wise. That night at Izod Center was an incredible night of heavyweight fights. I mean, we saw great finishes. Bigfoot Silva had it fantastic performance against Fedor, but it just sucks because the fight was stopped. It wasn't that Fedor got finished or anything like that. That kind of ruined it, and like the next card was Oversteam and Fabrizio for Doom. You know, that fight was... Oversteam? Overeem. (laughs) Okay. Overeem. That didn't leave a good impression in people's mouths, and now with this, hopefully they really have some great fights to finish off this tournament. Moving back to UFC... UFC on Versus 4 emanated from Pittsburgh, their first card in that area of Pennsylvania. And whoo-hoo, I think we all know the story, Rick's story, yeah. going around in the yeah. main event where Nate Marquardt substituting and other people filling in and blah, blah, blah. But even though it's set as Nate Marquardt against Rick's story, Marquardt set to make his debut at Welterweight a day before he gets suspended by the Pennsylvania State Athletic Commission for levels exceeding the allowed amount of testosterone, and he pretty much said that this was testosterone replacement therapy, I think uh, the same thing that Charles Sonnen was going through. Now, I think we all know if you need testosterone replaced in your own body what that indicates, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that, (laughs) that being said... He's out, Charlie Brenneman thrown in at the last second, and he gets the unanimous decision victory over Rick Story. Dana White said afterwards it was the Rocky Story of UFC. But then afterwards, Nate Marquardt's reinstated anyway. He complied with the Athletic Commission. So even though he got not only suspended, he got fired by the UFC the day before a big show like that. He was going to main event. Now he's cleared. So... Let's see what you think about Charlie Brenneman's performance against Rick Story, A, and B, the whole drama with Nate Marquardt. Well, I thought the performance was good. It was definitely a Rocky story in the sense that here's this last-minute replacement that nobody really knows, and he's fighting in front of his hometown crowd, and he beats the guy who is supposedly like one of the next biggest things in the welterweight division. It completely just stops the whole Rick Story train. 
good performance by him. He showed great wrestling, obviously, to add wrestler, a great wrestler like Rick Story. It's pretty impressive, so I'd like to see what they do with him. As far as uh, Nate Marquardt, putting anything in your body when you're a professional athlete is just very risky shit, and you really should clear it with everybody before you do that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm not a UFC fighter, so I don't know their whole nutrition regime and what's allowed or what's disallowed. The main thing you hear is that, like, well, Nate Marquardt's are on the sky, blah, blah, blah. But he's also been warned about this four times before. So I would understand why Dana White was so upset and did what he did. <laughs> Pat G in our chat room just said, fuck Nate Marquardt. <laughs> <laughs> that, I guess that sums it up. But he, right now, there's not really a lot of options, but he's the hottest free agent since Dan Henderson. There's been a lot of tours, so is he going to go to Bellator? What are they going to do with him? Because I really doubt he's going to be fighting in MFC or even go over to Dream or anything like that. But Dream. It, you, know, it also... <laughs> you know what FEG's real dream is? Not the MMA events, but to have more money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It builds more interest around the card. Whether it was good or bad, it just made people more drawn about that card. <laughs> It certainly did. It was definitely unique. I thought Rick Story didn't look too bad in defeat. Brenneman obviously looked better with his takedowns and controlling on the ground, but I think Rick Story looked all right going for some submission holds from his back. But, yeah, definitely an NFC decision for Brenneman. But I want to move on to the heavyweights because this was definitely a night for heavyweights. Matt Mitrione, undefeated still in UFC. I really like this guy. A lot of personality, great look, and he's pretty on fire defeating Christian Moorcraft in a second-round knockout, which looked great, L- looked a lot better than Christian Moorcraft with his fucking ugly face and love handles. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how do you think Matt Mitrione looked on his rise, Rod? I thought it looked good. I think Christian Warcraft, something about him, maybe his face, he looked like one of my old neighbors from Ranstown, just all <laughs> grown up. I think he looked like so, one of those masked creatures with guns from Fifth Element. Yeah, he just looked like he could be a tough guy, but when you see this guy beating up, I think Matt Mitrione is very good with his hands. I believe he has a lot of personality from the ultimate fighter, and I'm glad to see him doing good, and I really just can't wait to see him fight one of the guys in the main event of that show, Chet Congo. And that's how it ties together, because Matt Mitrione's next fight will be against Chet Congo, who... Man, that's a guy who's been real up and down. Like, a couple years ago, we were talking about this guy. Like, ooh, this guy could be uh, rising up the ranks in MMA and uh, UFC. And that really stopped. It's been really up and down for him. And well, after he getting... Well, he unless he had those two back-to-back losses. I mean, he, he lost to Ken Velasquez, but he lost to a decision. And he actually, like, rocked Ken Velasquez uh, one good time. And then... I think people really were down on him when uh, he got choked out by Frank Mir back at UFC 107 after that one punch. and He got so trounced, Mir, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but he's been doing good since then. I'll say, because I want to tie this into to wrestling in a, a little bit, but I wanted to point out that after this show, and this is before 132, keep in mind, the president, Dana White, said that this was the best card we've ever had. <laughs> now, of course, there were a lot more prelim and Facebook fights than were actually aired on Versus. And guys like Force Griffin's brother and Joe Daddy Stevenson saved their jobs. So it was kind of like the theme of the night that Tyson Griffin and Joe Daddy Stevenson saved their jobs. And it was do or die for a lot of these guys. And in this main event, Pat Barry, wow, th- this was called the, the biggest comeback in MMA history. And it's really hard not to agree with that because when Barry started rocking Congo with those punches, I mean, even the referee had his hand on Pat Barry about to stop yeah. when he saw that Congo. No, he had just a flash of life back in him. And speaking of flash, boom, right uppercut, flash knockout. Pat Barry looked like he was on the cusp of victory, but no. And that's what's great about MMA to me because anything literally can happen. It's It's yeah. almost like the opposite where – us as wrestling fans, it's almost obnoxious to the point where when we get together, every 
other fucking sentence out of our mouth for three hours is what's going to happen next. <laughs> Whereas in, in MMA, you never fucking know. You can make your picks. You can make your guesses. But it's not scripted. So, bam, shit like that can happen out of nowhere. I mean, we saw that last year, Rod, with that child's son in loss to Anderson Silva. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And the way, like, we react to these fights now, like, it's just amazing. It just shows, like, how great, like, the sport is because it's so unpredictable and because, like, you you never know what a fighter is going to do. It's just such a, a great sport just because like, it gives you that thrill, that satisfaction. Like, I, just, I remember your reaction, Eric, when Anderson Silva choked out Chelsea and you ran <laughs> around like a little girl. <laughs> and you so fell on the floor like you just lost your house. I did, and I like Anderson Silva, but I just I love the ass kicking that Charles Sutton gave him. All right, well, great. Congo and Mitrione meet next. But up next in the last show we're going to talk about for Mixed Martial Arts, we will move on to pro wrestling after that. And, yes, everyone's getting their thrills off of CM Punk, and that's fine, but we'll get to that in a little bit because the next event was UFC 132. I did make a point to say that Dana White said UFC on versus four just before that was the best card we ever had, quote-unquote. Well, I think he could probably say that after the next card that they had. Oh, my God. UFC 132 had every fight end pretty much in the first round, at least on the main pay-per-view card. A lot of big names, and the fight that didn't end in the first round was match of the night. But we'll get to that in order. Carlos Condit stopped Don Young Kim, the undefeated welterweight, with a first-round knockout. Don Young Kim has been saying in interviews in the past year or so that he thinks he can get in the ring with GSP, and or get in the cage with GSP, I should say. And I guess the one thing he had going for him was that undefeated streak, but guess what? There's a loss on there now. Your thoughts, Rod? Condit defeating Kim. I'm really loving this Condit run right now. A lot of people might be down because he lost his UFC debut, but ever since then, he's been in a tear, man. And I honestly thought that Carlos Condit was going to lose maybe by decision because Daniel King has been like, you know, looked good against uh, Nate Diaz and undefeated welterweight. I did not expect that at all. I did not expect that at all from him. Just, just like I didn't expect him knocking out Dan Hardy. Uh, he's looked really good, and I've if he beats BJ Penn, you cannot deny this kid a title shot. You cannot. Mm-hmm. Him fighting GSP, or if fucking Meteorite strikes the arena, if Nick Diaz wins, it'll be a great fight either way. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking with someone on YouTube, Rod, underneath the last radio show where we talked about MMA, and we both think you're nuts for thinking Nick Diaz has no chance against GSP. I mean, it's one thing to pick him, but to say that a guy like Nick Diaz is no shot, I don't know. I think it's going to be a lot closer than so. you think. I've said this before. I would be surprised if Nick Diaz could beat Matt Hughes. Oh, come on. But he's been on his hair. He's been good. But he hasn't faced guys who are even top four in UFC. Koscheck would destroy him. Fitch would destroy him. I don't know. I just think he fights very loose. I like the guy, but against GSP, I don't see a chance. I do think, if nothing else, Rod, I think you have to admit that it would be very interesting to see it, though, because you know Diaz is going to push the pace. I know. Hey, I'm I'm excited for the fight. I really didn't think after GSP beat Shields that they were really going to do this, but it just shows how fast. A year ago, would you ever think that this fight, Eric, was happening in UFC on Strike Force? Like, well, it's no. Just, it's just crazy what happens like in the sport. You're getting these fights you always wanted to see, and that's what's great. So, hey, it would be great. The fights we always wanted to see, like GSP Anderson Silva and Fedor Kocher? Yeah, well, we can't get everything. <laughs> we can't get everything, but we did get Chuck Liddell and Van Lens Silva. We did get Jake Shields, GSP. We did I get know. Brock Lesnar. Yeah. Hey, UFC. Rod, you know i got to be devil's advocate sometime. I know, I know, I know. Speaking of which, when we talked about Overeem before, John Howard was just released by UFC at welterweight. I was a fan of his, but I, I like how afterwards he said, well, I'm thinking of going to Bellator or whatever the hell he said. How come he didn't say strike force? If this is business as usual and there's supposed to be two separate things and the contracts won't let them do it, well, not in Nick Diaz's case, why didn't he say strike force then? Hmm? 
He probably looks at them as one. At that I know, point. I know. I'm just, I'm just it's, pointing it out. I know it's nuts. It's nuts. So I think it's gonna be business as usual until end of the year. <laughs> well, when they pulled over him out of the tournament, that's exactly what I thought. Yep, business as usual. <laughs> business as usual. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Could be fighting at probably UFC New Year's Eve. Well, in Japan, <laughs> business <laughs> is unusual was the next bout in the light heavyweight division. Tito Ortiz and Ryan Bader. Yeah. Could you say surprise, Rod? I can say hell fucking yeah. I'm a fan of Tito Ortiz, no matter how many people don't like him, no no matter how much he trash talks. To me, he was like one of the first true mixed martial artists that was creating strike chain, wrestling, and everything. And now, Eric, we saw his great submission skills. And wow, was I... Just happy to see that happen. It was like one of those surreal, great yeah. MMA moments. Like Randy Couture beating Tim Silver for the belt. It's great to see that resurgence. Do you think it's like Couture and Sylvia because it was someone from the old guard in UFC who people pretty much wrote off or didn't expect much out of anymore? Especially with Ortiz. I mean, he hasn't won a fight in UFC since, what, Shamrock? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, since a spicy V card with uh, Ken Shamrock. Right, so it's been years, and he's been in and out, but it's been years since he's won a UFC fight, and we all know he's had nagging injuries. I have so many questions for you about this one, but yeah, I was one of the people completely writing off Tito Ortiz. Before this, I said they might as well just fire him now. <laughs> I figured <laughs> I figured Ryan Bader, he's only had one loss, and it's against John Jones. So who else is he going to lose to? So I really thought Bader was going to make a comeback here, but now he's lost his last two fights. I couldn't believe it because Tito Ortiz caught him in a guillotine and tapped him out. My God, even though I wrote him off before it happened, I was so thrilled to see it. It was really cool to see that, but I do have some questions about that. For one, when the numbers came out afterwards and we saw how much he earned, I'm sure you read in the notes I sent you, Tito Ortiz ended up getting $450,000 just to fight. That's not including any bonuses that night. His opponent, Bader, got $20,000. Now, I understand the whole idea is that this guy helped build UFC. He's a legend. They want to compensate him, I suppose. But, and I, I'm, I'm all for that. But to have such a disparity, to have such a vast difference between what he got paid and his opponent got paid, let's give a comparison. The second highest paid fighter that night was Wanderlei Silva. Of course, you could say the same thing for him. Pride veteran, been around forever, helped build the sport. He got $200,000. Fine, but don't you think it's kind of silly that Tito Ortiz is in a fight that if he loses, he's pretty much going to get fired, hasn't won in years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is getting almost half a million dollars, but the main event with a champion in it, no less, he got paid, Dominic Cruz, $40,000, Uriah Faber got $32,000, Cruz got a fight bonus too, a win bonus, but still, that's significantly less than Ortiz combined the two main eventers. Now, I know there might be something in there with the WEC deal, but being that UFC is so prosperous right now and has been making so much money, one of the things people have been saying is that they're still in the public's eye, a step behind in boxing. We all know that law to get passed in New York once again failed. Don't you think that one of the criticisms where people say one of the reasons that MMA is behind in boxing is the pay because we all know Money Mayweather and Pacquiao and those sort of guys in a sport that's really not even that hot outside of one or two times a year get so much money, whereas UFC, the top promotion in the world for MMA, gets away with paying most of their roster like that. I mean, What do you think about Tito Ortiz's pay, and do you think it's fair, or am I just off? Compared to everyone else in the card, yeah, I think it's a little high, especially with talent like Dominic Cruz. I mean, if you get pay him whatever amount of money, I'm sure Brock Lesnar's debut, he probably got paid, if not the most, the second most on that card. Um, right. You're going to pay whatever brings you pay-per-views. I think more people were interested in the main event than the Tito Ortiz fight. At uh, this point, I, yeah. I, or at that point in the MMA landscape and Tito Ortiz's career, I would say yes. Yeah, exactly. 450000 is a lot. I mean, I would have paid him 
maybe like a hundred. If you have a fighter who's like almost grateful that they have a job now, to him now that UFC has strike force, like where else would he go? And I know he has other businesses on the side, but he's a fighter at heart and he's gonna want to stay in UFC. I agree with you to the point where like it's definitely the big difference in Boston when you hear forty million, thirty five million, whatever for uh, Pacquiao and Mayweather, and UFC fighters want that. I mean, that's been a big grief for Nick Diaz, too. That's why he wanted to get into boxing. But, I right. mean, not every UFC pay-per-view has those kind of magnitudes. You only have very few fights a year that has what I like to call, like, the Mike Tyson feel to a fight, where you know that everybody's watching. If it's a Mayweather-Pacquiao fight, you know that majority of people are going to be watching that, and that's going to be all over Sports Center. If UFC had more big fights like that, I think they could start bringing in boxer money. Mm-hmm. And I think boxing has more investors and has more sponsors, and they know they're going to have more viewership overall. It's still one of those public perception things for the, quote, sweet science, which is ridiculous because if boxing is a sweet science, MMA is a sweet chemistry because there's so many elements of all the fight and martial arts styles combined into it. But, yeah, it's like when – AOL Time Warner wanted to get rid of WCW, even though it was the highest rated program on TNT and TBS, supposedly. The head of programming, Jamie Kellner, said, eh, it doesn't attract the right sponsors. And we all know that even in their best years, WWE, even to this day in the PG era, still don't attract the big, let's say, Super Bowl-style advertisers. You don't see car commercials. Yeah. You don't see that sort of stuff. You see video you games and Axe Body well. Spray and all that stupid shit. Right. Right. I agree with you. You don't see Coca-Cola. You don't see all these big-name corporations. The UFC just really needs to make the public understand how good of cards they have from top to bottom. Because if you watch a boxing fight, people... Oh, it's horrible. Oh, yeah. It's the worst. I, I mean, I actually used to sit through these fights waiting for my Tyson, and they don't you know, care. They're talking about <laughs> other stuff. Sometimes they show these announcers talking ringside while the undercard's going on. I mean... Oh, my God. And you yeah. don't know better... Like, just last year when it was Pacquiao and Miguel Cotto, it was the same thing. You sit through two or three boring fights that all go the distance. So in boxing, that's like 12 rounds. And you don't know who any of these guys are. They don't promote it. They don't make it exciting. And you're just waiting for the main event, and maybe you'll get something decent. Yeah, I mean, that last Pacquiao and Sugar Shane multi-fight was really garbage. And I feel like if UFC put on a big fight like that, I promise, and it was garbage, they would get ripped for it. No one's ripping apart boxing as if it's ripping apart the individual. Like, mostly, it was obviously he didn't want to fight. But it's like if that was UFC, people would be like, oh, we'll see. It's not as good as you thought, blah, blah, blah. It's so boring. People just need to just get more educated on the sport. And I feel like it's really going to take time. I mean, this boom only started about six years ago and it took boxing for years to evolve. And it's just going to be a matter of time, Eric, before MMA evolves into the boxing status. Well, keep in mind that boom in a couple more fights, Rod, because as we finish up our MMA talk, I want to tie it into wrestling and really what's going on with Punk right now. But speaking of these great cards top to bottom, back to UFC 132, because in the middleweight division, Chris Lieben beat Wanderlei Silva in the first round in what? (laughs) A few seconds? Wow, Chris Lieben did it. I wouldn't have expected that. Honestly, was going for Vandalay for the knockout. I thought he was going to beat him in maybe first or second round, but Chris Lieben showed he was a smart fighter. Lieben's stock, I think, had already been on the rise last year after getting two wins about two weeks apart. And I think he's always been kind of a fan favorite. But yeah, in yeah. this case, I think name-wise, this is his biggest win yet, and he looked great doing it. He's going to fight again in October in the England card, 138. But do you think that Wanderlei Silva is now getting into this area of Chuck Liddell and guys like that who are getting up there and have no chin anymore. Does he really need to hang it up, maybe just become a trainer or something? I don't think he wants to. I mean, uh, <laughs> well, clearly he doesn't. Hey, hey, fucking Crow Cop is fighting again. Even Crow Cop is fighting again. I think just give him one more shot. This guy had off for like a year. He had surgery. He beat one of the top guys in the middleweight division just a year ago. So, I mean... Just because he got knocked out by a knockout artist doesn't mean we should write him off just yet. I was about to write off Tito Ortiz, and he's main eventing in Philadelphia. I don't right. think we should write off Ben Lynn Silver just yet. 
Well, I'm glad you brought up the main event in Philadelphia because I'm going to that in a couple of weeks, and I forgot to bring it up when we were talking about Tito Ortiz. So real quick, subbing for Phil Davis who was really not who they wanted in the main event in the first place anyway. That would be John Bones Jones defending the light heavyweight title against Rashad Evans. So now, as it turned out, it's Rashad Evans and Tito Ortiz, a rematch. And Ortiz, looking great after that fight with Ryan Bader. A, do you think that after looking at how he moved and how he behaved, let's say, in the last fight that he's healed up from a lot of these nagging injuries he's claimed to have said? And B, do you think that a uh, victory over Rashad Evans propels Tito Ortiz into title contention like Dana White's been hinting? How do you think everything's going to go down? Before A, I'm going to say that whenever Rashad Evans is announced in the main event, I'm always going to assume it's not going to happen. <laughs> I, 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 I think we should just forget about Rashad. If it's a planned fight, I wish there was a Vegas, Vegas better line to see that Rashad Evans will not fight at his intended opponent. But all right, with the Tito Ortiz issue, A, since he finished the first round, didn't take a lot of damage that UFC thought, wow, this guy's on a hot streak. We really need another guy to face Rashad Evans, and Yoda Machido is supposedly asking for Anderson Silva money. Once Tito denied, they were really panicking, but I think he has a good shot with their first meeting, even though it was a few years ago, and I feel like Rashad Evans has developed a lot more than Tito has. If Tito did not grab the cage, he would have won that fight. It was a yeah, draw. Yeah, that point cost yeah. the whole fucking fight. Exactly. People would be talking about Tito a lot more different. He's been competitive in his fight. He almost finished Lula Machida. If he held out to that triangle three seconds more, he would have been the first person to finish Lyoto Machida. Lyoto even admitted that he was almost ready to tap out. People look in the Matt Hamill fight and, and the Forrest Griffin fight and thought that he has him look good. I think it's a good shot against Rashad. And what was the second part of the question? If he deserves a title shot? Yeah. If if uh, Ortiz um, wins, do you think that he's uh, in contention? I mean, I Dana White's so. a promoter. He probably sees dollar signs in that prospect. I would. I would. I definitely would. Rashad wins, he's the number one contender. I think if he loses to Tito, like, just imagine a, a Tito Rampage main event, or Tito even John Jones main event. Mm -hmm. It would draw numbers, 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 and I think that would get a lot of mainstream attention, more than Rashad. If I was the UFC, I'd be banking for Tito to win. Recently, when we talked about MMA on this show, Rod, I said I was disappointed with a lot of the WEC fighters who had come over. I was hoping for some more highlight reel finishes, and you said I was going too hard on them because they're on a different stage and there's a lot of pressure, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe I was, but I did say, hopefully, Dominic Cruz and Uriah Faber can make up for that. I think they did. Yeah. Big time. Dominic yeah. Cruz defended the bantamweight title against Uriah Faber and won a very close fight by unanimous decision. I scored it three rounds to two in Cruz's favor. That was rather close, but possible fight of the year contender so far. What would you think of the Cruz-Faber title fight? Well, first, I thought the hype for it was spectacular. The countdown for the show, people were saying, and I, I agree, it's probably one of the best countdown shows that I've seen, the back and forth talk between Uriah Faber and Dominic Cruz, and it wasn't like silly talk either, like these guys, these two great athletes, legitimately don't like each other, and it was just very interesting and very well put together, and really got you hyped up for the fight. The fight itself is kind of exactly how I expected it. Dominic Cruz could be a little faster. He's kind of, not out-wrestled Faber, but like beat him to a punch a lot of times, I mean, Faber was on his back at all, really. Dominic Cruz just really showed why he is who he is and why he's a dominant champion, and I was glad to see him good in San Andres. Awesome. And that was an awesome show. But yeah. as I said, I wanted to tie the MMA boom, let's call it, into everything that's going on now with CM Punk and WWE. Reason being, let's face it, Rod, you and me, uh, I'm sorry, you and I, are the ones who end up talking about MMA. <laughs> it's been an hour-long <laughs> conversation, essentially, between myself and you. And yep. hopefully people find that entertaining who are into MMA, but there are a lot of fans who say, why are you guys talking about MMA? It's the wrestling roundtable, blah, 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 and skip ahead and all that other sort of shit. So obviously 
there's some fans who only watch one or the other, but there are some fans in the middle who watch both. And I always found it great about this show when people get turned on to MMA. Some people have said that I didn't really watch it before, but the passion that you guys have when you talk about it really made me more interested, and I'm into it now. And that's been very satisfying. But I've also noticed lately a lot of people, and maybe in your circle of friends too, I'm not sure, but I also noticed a lot of people aren't really watching too much anymore. They're not as into it as we are, let's say. And Royce, specifically out in California, I believe in San Diego, has been on our message board and Facebook and et cetera, asking me if this is really just a fad, if I'm going to be talking about it like this in several years, or if MMA is going to be as big as it is, and as big as it is via UFC, really, because, I mean, FEG is on its last legs, practically, and... UFC bought out Strike Force this year. UFC is MMA for all intents and purposes, to the public anyway. I mean, if you're a diehard like us, we know about Bellator and Titan and the other sort of lower MMA promotions out there on the ladder. But what do you think about this idea that Royce is proposing? Because people were saying UFC 100, this is the height, it's not going to go any further. But I'm looking at it like we may have lost out in New York, but practically every state Every other state is sanctioning MMA now. UFC in Brazil coming up next month just sold out in, what, 74 minutes. They're debuting in all these different places. But we've also seen a lot of injuries force changes. We just talked about 133 in Philadelphia and how many times that's changed. There's so many people dropping out now. Lesnar, their top draw is going to be out till next year. A lot of fights changing, and Dave Meltzer on Yahoo just said that because UFC is offering these guys insurance now, a lot of guys aren't fighting through injuries anymore, and they're claiming it. So instead of going through a fight and claiming they got hurt in it, they're just dropping out now. We've seen this so many times this past year. Do you think that this is affecting UFC's boom at all, and do you see any sort of change in the zeitgeist or balance, let's say, because WWE is really on a hot streak right now with CM Punk and that whole angle. No, I just think it's it's really in the beginning, and as long as Dana White and Zufa can do this, hopefully there are a lot of young minds out there who are really studying what they're doing, who are working along with them, who are being bred to take over whenever Dana White for Tidus decides to step down. I really think it just could go to a lot of places. It really just needs education. There's going to be a lot more stars to come, like a lot of new stars. There's going to be that person, that Brock. I, I feel like in a few years, this could get that star that's really going to capture the mainstream's audience. I don't think it's going to be a fad because it's evolving every day, and sooner or later, you could get in Madison Square Garden. They start doing fight nights on ESPN, whatever deal that's possible. I think it's just going to get a lot bigger. The younger generation is really starting to almost know more about this evolving sport than people even our age or older. I think it's going to be around for a long, long time. I just don't see how there can be any going back at this point because it's a sport. Exactly. Basketball was down in the dumps for a while. I mean, not down in the dumps. They're still producing great numbers, obviously, but it was never in the, the Michael Jordan era, the Michael Jordan hype. And recently with LeBron James, Basketball had one of its greatest seasons ever. Like, most viewers, because it, they found a reason that so much hate towards LeBron James, that emotion was put in. I think once emotion like that gets put in MMA, it's going to get bigger. I feel like it's going to get a lot bigger. Well, glad we're on the same board. And as long as we don't get too many dislikes and thumbs down and all that shit, maybe we'll just keep talking about MMA, Rod. <laughs> wah, tell them wah. <laughs> in between MMA and pro wrestling first we're going to have a little break because we want to go over some of the news some of the latest news items courtesy of WrestlingRoundTable.com The Sheik defeated Ryoji Sai on July 4th at Tokyo's Kurokan Hall to win the 0-1 title no word on how much The Sheik bribed Sai to win that one on Monday morning, July 18th, WWE suspended Sin Cara for 30 days due to a wellness policy violation, testing positive for steroids on Monday, June 20th. In his defense, Cara said the roids were recommended by Sensei Levescu, who did say to come to him if he needed anything. 
TNA has released Orlando Jordan, who is used to being released, but it's usually on his own stomach. Kimbo Slice's pro boxing debut takes place Saturday, August 13th from Miami, Oklahoma's Buffalo Run Casino. It will be against James Wade in a four-round main event. Rumors are they also considered adding stipulations of timeouts, and only Kimbo may throw punches. Former WWE wrestler Rico Constantino was reinstated in June by the Taxi Cab Authority as a TA enforcement supervisor after serving a lengthy suspension, allegedly for breaking and entering in private residence without a warrant, speeding in and crashing a police vehicle, and many other violations. When reached for a comment, Constantino said he pulled over many people for driving not fast and furious, but fierce and fabulous. He also said he liked taking the law into his own hands and would like it even more if the law was shaped like a penis. On WWE's SmackDown tour of South Africa, at the beginning of July, many wrestlers and crew members had items, such as watches, GPS devices, security walkie-talkies, and clothing, stolen from their bags, a crime discovered when baggage came out of the carousel in Cape Town. Reportedly, the black market for wrist tapes, somas, and baby oil in South Africa boomed. And those are some of the latest news items, courtesy of WrestlingRoundTable.com. Go there for more. Also on WrestlingRoundTable.com are some new polls. Some of our latest poll results, however, are on two polls we had recently up. What's the Ultimate Warrior's next piece of dirty Hulk Hogan laundry? I'm sure most of you saw Ultimate Warrior's YouTube video that lasted five hours about how Hulk Hogan's a scumbag and everything. So what are some of the things he's got up his sleeve about Hulk Hogan? 7% of you said Hogan can't read. 12% said you thought it would be that Hogan's current wife is a Brooke DNA clone. 13% that it's going to come out. Hogan's real name is Shep Ramsey. You're a dead man, Ramsey. Another 15% of you said that it's going to come out. Hogan hates gays. 25% of you said it's going to be revealed. Hogan's not a real blonde. Perish the thought. Maybe those extensions are died too. But 28% of you said it's going to come out that Hulk Hogan was a gay escort. The other poll we had was, what was Macho Man's best rivalry? Kevin Nash, Dusty Rhodes, and the worm, Dennis Rodman, all scored 0%. Really? Not even one person thought Dusty Rhodes or Kevin Nash pouring shit on Macho Man or Dennis Rodman? <laughs> I enjoyed the Dennis Rodman feud from 99. I wouldn't vote for it, but I enjoyed it. 1% of you voted for two people. It was split evenly between Crush and Jerry the King Lawler. Jerry the King Lawler is an interesting one because we covered a little bit Macho Man's early career in the 70s when he was running a rival promotion with his father, ICW, against the Jarretts and Lawler in Memphis. And eventually they ended up working together, but then... Much later on, in 1993, Macho Man went to USWA and worked with Lawler then, too. So it's funny how things work out in wrestling. However, all of those people I've mentioned so far lost out to Slim Jim. Snap into a Slim Jim! That rivalry went over two promotions. That got 3% of the vote. Now on to the meat, some of the big feuds. 7% said the Ultimate Warrior. Hmm, only 7 11% said Ric Flair which bled over into WCW, and I enjoyed a lot, too. 12% said Jake the Snake Roberts. Very memorable. That really got Jake the Snake over as a heel. I'm surprised this ranked so high, but cool. 17% said DDP. Definitely the NWO feud that made DDP a star. And now we get into the heavy hitters. 20% said Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, which is funny because unlike a lot of these others that were mentioned it was rather brief, only lasted in one promotion, but led to one of the greatest matches of all time. And the way it tied in even the feud with George Animal Steel the year before, just brilliant. But moving on to New Horizons, we go to number one. 28%, most of you, voted for Macho Man's best rivalry as Hulk Hogan. And I think that's about right. Once again, going over two promotions, on again, off again, involving Mega Powers, Miss Elizabeth, NWO, Macho King, Sensational Sherry. This was all over. I also find it funny that in WCW, <laughs> you may remember this, Rod, Macho Man won the title a few times in WCW, but Hogan ended two title reigns in a day. 
Macho Man won the title twice and lost to Hogan the next day. I never realized that until you pointed it out, and I was like, wow, maybe Hogan is an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Even when Savage came into WCW, because we've talked about it here and on the video portion of our talk on Savage before, Rod, that I get real upset that people look over WCW when they look back at Macho Man's career. I thought it was really cool when he showed up because they did that angle where is he going to shake Hogan's hand or slap him in the face? And they've had such an on-again, off-again relationship, you really didn't know. I was real excited to find out about that. Yeah, yeah. I thought they put him in right. And I remember being, as a kid, watching him go to WCW, and like, wait a minute, why the hell is he wrestling in WCW and not in WWF? <laughs> so it's good to see him back in the ring. Well, it's always good to talk about Macho Man. So those are some of the results of our latest polls. We've got two polls up right now. What do you think we should talk about on our next videotaping as far as the topic? And where is CM Punk's belt going to end up next? You can vote now at WrestlingRoundTable.com. But moving on to pro wrestling, before we do that, let's go to some calls. Amato from Texas. Hello. Hey, guys. What's going on? WWE should start doing some more pay-per-views in Chicago. I mean, I know everybody <laughs> saw that crowd, and just like the WrestleMania 22 crowd that just booed Cena that was cheering for Triple H, same went for Punk. When the crowd's into it like that, it seems like it's just a good show, even though the two ladder matches and the championship matches or the ones that mattered anyway were good. But, but like the it. crowd really made it seem like a big show atmosphere. Yeah. Everyone was talking about that it had a WrestleMania feel to it, yeah. and just like everybody on forums were talking about the week before, the Raw before, it just felt like WrestleMania was right around the corner. Mm -hmm. Two things. One of them was about Sean. He recently did an interview, and I didn't know about it. I was wondering why there was no more blood uh, in WWE. But this was a while back, and I, I'd read. And I didn't know that um, at the Bash in 2008, I believe, when they did that storyline with Jericho with the eye, yeah. that uh, Vince, Vince had some... Uh, potential sponsor there, and when they saw Shawn Michaels with blood all over his face, they pulled out, and that was the reason they had stopped the whole blood feud, uh, the blood uh, bleeding and stuff, and I, I mean, I didn't know if anybody else knew about it, and I thought it was very interesting. The last thing was, I really, really want y'all to do the Montreal as y'all's next shoot. Maybe you can put it in the whole Montreal incident, and every car reincarnation that somebody always tries to get screwed. Uh, by a submission because Vince almost did it on Sunday, and y'all can talk about that later, but I think it's something that needs to be talked about. <laughs> well, <laughs> they definitely were playing off of that and played off it well, but that is a possibility you can vote for over at WrestlingRoundTable.com now, so cast your vote. 574 area code. Name and location, please. Nicholas Wellborn. Oh, okay. You changed your number. Okay. Yeah. Corey's going to back me up. The um, tournament idea. Me and her were talking about on Twitter about introducing a new WWE title look and stuff. I suggested WWE should vacate the title, hold a tournament, and introduce a new title at the next pay-per-view SummerSlam. And when Wall started up, when Vincent McMahon announced that the title had been vacated, then he's going to hold a tournament. I was like, oh my gosh, I, my prediction is coming true. <laughs> Well, I guess the more replica belts they can sell, the better. But we'll get into that a little later on. Abe in Augusta, Georgia? I do notice one thing at Money in the Bank that happened. I don't know that you noticed it or not. When Randy Orton, spoiler alert, and when the Christian spit in Randy Orton's face, he's like, you spit in my face, you spit in my face. And I'm sitting there thinking, didn't you spit in everyone's face five, six, whatever years ago like crazy? Mm -hmm. And they hypocritical, playing to the storyline of like him you know, losing the belt on a DQ. Some people are praising Christian for winning the belt on a DQ, but... Bash the mess out of Sheamus on oh, not winning tables match. What's the difference? TNA's Destination X was the X Division themed pay per view that just happened, Corey. And being someone who's a independent fan, I'm sure that you appreciated this style more. A definite change of pace from the Hogan slash immortal centric pay per views that they've been doing. They brought back the six sided ring which is a welcome addition in my eyes. And they featured primarily younger guys. In fact, in some cases, guys who hadn't been seen in a really long time. With the exception, of course, of Rob Van Dam and Jerry Lynn. But let's start off with Kazarian's victory over Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe is someone, Corey, that has been pretty lost in the shuffle lately. In fact, he's been used recently to put over Crimson, their new prospect. So... How do you think the opener went of Samoa Joe losing to Kaz? 
it was kind of an okay match. I didn't really like the finish, though. I didn't like how Kazarian won. I was really rooting for Samoa Joe. It was a good match up until that last point. I really think that they've dropped the ball on Samoa Joe. I really don't like how they've got him with a losing streak now. The match was a good opener, the right match to open the show. I think Joe should have won only for the fact that it doesn't hurt Joe or it doesn't hurt Kazarian. Really, this entire kind of show doesn't really mean anything except for like maybe the last two matches. It doesn't even count, pretty much. Well, they're kind of in so, their own bubble. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't really matter who wins. You're going to have a good wrestling match. So, overall, the match I thought was very good. But Joe should have won it. The match was very good. The pay, at least for Generation Me, wasn't very good. So after this pay-per-view, at some point, they asked for their release, which they got it. And some of the lower-card guys, like Generation Me and Jay Lethal, we're seeing them pop up in Ring of Honor and other places now, and that's because they get paid to wrestle. And if they're not being used, they're not making money. TNA's starving a lot of these guys. But a lot of them are so desperate to get back on the national stage, like we'll see later on in the four-way, they come back no matter what. But as it is, Eric Young and Shark Boy defeated Generation Me. Corey, your thoughts on the tag match with the once and now again Young Bucks? It was nice to see Shark Boy again because I've always liked him and I've always been big on Eric Young. But this match felt very hastily thrown together. I think that if given maybe an extra minute's worth of time, this could have been a really nice tag team match. I was shocked that Generation Me did not win but not shocked that they asked for their release, considering how TNA really wasn't doing very much with them. Well, they're certainly not alone. Some people got out while they could, I suppose. Yeah, this match was so weird put together. It was just, like, so random. You couldn't find some TV time the week before just to say something about that. And I wouldn't blame them for wanting to be released. They were being featured on Impact a lot, as far as the whole X Division thing. And then they're put on the show, and they lose. If, if, if anything, they're saving their own career because if they keep losing the way they are, who's going to want to hire them? So, well, this is wrestling. Anybody will hire anybody practically. Yeah, I know a, that. On a downward trend. If, if you're on yeah. TV, because that's the idea. If you're on TV, you at least have some sort of name value. Not saying that you, you'd get in with WWE, but if you're some bumfuck NWA or whatever, it's just a mini, well, we're going to bring in the guys around TNA. So that's their logic. But they're young guys, so they've got a lot of years ahead of them. And yeah, I agree. They, they seem to be in decent shape. Mm-hmm. <laughs> decent shape. <laughs> they're fucking flipping around New York, so of course they're in decent shape. Ultimate X featured Alex Shelley in a victory over Robbie E., who I know you like, TLD, E.E.E., mm-hmm. Shannon Moore, and the Amazing Red. Alex Shelley now the number one contender for the X Division title. You excited about the prospects of Spanky and Shelley, Corey? Absolutely. I was rooting for Alex Shelley the entire way. The match was pretty good. My only real critique, though, is that Robbie E. tends to oversell to the point of looking like a cartoon in the ring. But I was really happy that Alex Shelley won. Uh, well, that's his character. He's going to overreact. He's a heel. He's supposed to overreact. Mr. Perfect overreacted everything he did. So Yeah, but, but with Mr. Perfect, it was different. With Robbie not, E., it was comedically bad. But, again, that's part of his character, that he takes a, a move and he bumps it. When he takes a bump, he overreacts it because he doesn't want to hurt himself because of his good looks. So Isn't he a comedy character it. anyway? Yeah, he is in a way, but he, he does have a serious side to him. When they push him or he acts correctly, he could be taken more, a little more seriously. Mm-hmm. But I like where uh, what's his face climbed the top of the uh, Ultimate X and tried to grab it from on top of it. So I thought the ending was really good. And the right guy won, that's for sure. So I thought it was actually a really good match. It wasn't like the previous ones, but it was still very good, pay-per-view quality in my eyes. I liked Much the like- ending visual when Chris Sabin came out to congratulate Alex Shelley. That was really nice. Details do count, especially if you're a a Ware wrestling fan like most of us are. But the next match was pretty much like the main event in that it was really trying to recreate past glory. In this case, Rob Van Dam and Jerry Lynn, number 175. But (laughs) despite that, both guys, for their age, if you want to put them together, obviously stay in good shape as best they can and seem to be able to still go. But... Let's see if they lived up to Corey's expectations. I think this was a pretty good match. It wasn't what I expected. I didn't expect them to use a chair in this match. But I think it was a lot better than it could have been, considering Rob Van Dam's other TNA matches at pay-per-views this year. And Jerry Lynn's back injury from last year. 
Yeah, I'm very glad that Lynn is wrestling again. I've always liked him, even when he was Ring of Honor champ. This match was a little slower because of their age. It has a lot to do with it. But the one spot that got me back into the match was when Jerry Lynn kind of like threw him almost three-fourths of the way across the ring, and Rob Van Dam's head landed right on a chair. If you haven't seen it, I would check it out on the Internet if you can find it. It's a pretty sick powerball. Did oh. you see that, Corey? What did you think of that? That was very scary, actually. I didn't yeah. see that coming. Yeah, that was actually the point where I, I opened my eyes. I was like, ooh, that looked like it hurt. That got me back into the match. So, But overall, I thought the ending, I liked it. The right person won. It was good. It was a good marquee match. And the video before it was really good, too. So I was happy with it. Austin Aries recently returned to TNA. And in this match, a four-way with Jack Evans, Loki, and Zima Ion won a contract with TNA. And I say that name slowly because what TNA always does, it always throws me off, Corey, They'll get an indie guy, and half the time they'll change up their name to something like their original name. Like, I still have a hard time with Madison Rain because I think of Ashley Lane. Now, of course, I'm thinking of Shima Zion, and now it's Zima Ion, so <laughs> I have a hard time pronouncing it. But uh, Will Keen, Jack Evans returning to TNA, even if for just a brief cup of coffee. Aries wins the contract, so he's back in. Your thoughts on the four-way? This match stole the show. I loved every aspect of it. The crowd seemed to love this match, too. There was one area where all four men are down on the canvas. The entire crowd looks to the back and goes, Sign them all! This is wrestling! Sign them all! And I just loved the energy that that this match had. This absolutely stole the show for me. Yeah, that was definitely with the best match on the show. That was a phenomenal match. All four of those guys deserve a lot of credit for working pretty hard. Aries didn't work as hard as the other ones. I think that's part of his gimmick going away, too. By work so, as hard, you mean flip as much? Yes. I got, <laughs> I got. Well, I wouldn't blame him for not taking some moves in that match. There were just some moves that were just... Jack Evans, that guy is just phenomenal. I, yeah. I, I mean, he's not marketable. But he's phenomenal what? in the ring. What? He's not, not marketable. marketable. Yeah. Guy's fucking Eminem and can flip in the air a million times before landing on his feet. What's not marketable about him? There's something about him that just don't, I don't see dollar signs on. You can watch him and he can look really great in the ring, but in the end of the day, would you wear his T-shirt? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> You're asking someone who's also years ahead of you on Jack Evans. Sorry, but. If you'd seen this guy over the years like I have, I don't think you'd be arguing whether he's marketable or not. Incidentally, Caligula Ravishing in our chat room asking about who I side with in the New Jack Terry situation. New Jack, she seems like a crazy cunt. Moving on. (laughs) Brian Kendrick defeated Abyss for the X Division title. I guess this is part of Immortals' whole thing of taking the X title away from the smaller guys, and now it's back in the Guru's side, I guess they would call him. So I know a lot of people have been shitting on some of his recent stuff, the gimmick affecting part of the matches, but what do you think on Brian Kendrick getting the title, Corey? I'm happy that Brian Kendrick won because I was cheering for him the entire time. But this match really was not what I expected. It was very hasty, very sloppily booked. I'm just very grateful that Spanky won. In other words, now we can get on to better things, I guess. Yes, we can all move on with our lives now. Spanky got the title. I thought the match was really good. I like the immortal involvement in it because, again, it brings the storyline into it. I didn't get too involved where it was bad. So I, I liked it. I think the ending was great with all the confetti and everything. They make it really important. And it's good to see the X Division get an important look like that when something like that happens where someone saves uh, and makes it important and he's like the defender of it. He's really stepped up his game. And I thought the match was still really good. I thought he did great for a guy that size. Dave versus Goliath kind of match. Sometimes those matches don't look that great. And this one looked really good. So I liked it. Cool. And... A message directly to Pat in our message board as far as wrestling shirts. You know what shirt I would wear? The Wrestling Roundtable t-shirt, and you can get it at WrestlingRoundtable.com. I would wear the Pro Wrestling Respect shirt, too. Moving on to the main event, AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels, I alluded to before, trying to recapture their past glory. I think the general consensus on this was that it wasn't as good as it used to be, but it's still all right. What do you think, Corey? This was a good match, but certainly there were some spots where it looks like both men were looking at each other like, I've tried this move. I've tried that move. For a while, it just did not seem like either man was going to back down. I thought Christopher was going to win, but I think this is one of those rare matches where no matter what the outcome, the fans went home happy anyway. 
And it was a nice visual with the little huggy poo after the match. Very nice visual. This match failed as a main event pay per view. Stop being so negative. Not, Just enjoy no, it. I, no, I, I, I tried. <laughs> I liked the other matches before that than this one. This was not entertaining to me at all. They're showing all these videos of all these amazing moves that they did, and they barely performed any of it. They tried to stick to traditional wrestling, and I hate to say that's not something you see in the main event. You don't see traditional lockups slowing down the pace of the match. You can't do that in the main event, and it bored the hell out of me. Wait a minute. I was, Punk and Cena just did that sort of stuff in their whoa, main whoa, event, whoa, whoa, and the crowd was all over it. But what? But the emotion was the different maker in that. There was more emotion involved. This did not meet expectations, and they hyped it too much that it failed to capture what they had before. I guess that's mm-hmm. the best way I could say it. So Should that's Samoa why Joe have been in the match? Yeah, it probably would have added an element to it. I think Samoa Joe should have been in the match. There's nothing wrong with having the same match three times over a span of a couple of years. We do it everywhere. I mean, it's it's not like Triple H and Batista three months in a row. This would be over since 2005. (laughs) Yeah, which is why when they announced the main event, I wasn't happy about that main event because I was like, I think Joe needs to be in it. He needs to steam back. And the fact that they didn't put him in it, it did not meet expectations. And I think it hurt the pay-per-view overall in the end because, again, what came out of this pay-per-view? Absolutely nothing because nothing mattered at the end of the day because the next week, we're talking about the next the new TNA champion right after that. Well, okay. on, along the similar line there, TNA made the stupid mistake of announcing a week before they started having the Impact Wrestling taping where they announced the pay-per-view. They had up on the website Destination X, Samoa Joe versus AJ Styles versus Christopher Daniels. And then they changed it a few days later on the TV show, and then they changed the website. So, yeah, on that point, I can see where Joe should have been in that match because That's what TNA had for four days on their own website. Samuel in San Diego. Hello. Hey, what's up, Eric? I was more concerned about money in the bank in the first place. Loved the show, by the way. It was a great blow-off in uh, Chicago. But I uh, had a comment about uh, Fafita. I think the only reason why he was upset about Mr. Anderson is because he picked him. (laughs) Whoa, whoa, we got a whole thing on that, so we'll get to that later. Uh, We will. Let's get to Money in the Bank. SmackDown's Money in the Bank, which was won by Daniel Bryan. Or as Corey would say, the burial of Daniel Bryan continues. WWE's the worst thing ever. I hate them. Let's see what you really thought, Corey. Is it going to be a cynic? Well, he's going to be the first guy to lose it, or are you happy for a change? I'm not saying he's going to be the first one to lose it. I would Even love if he does, isn't that better than what you were complaining about before, about being on the lower cards of SmackDown? Boo-hoo. I do want to know why WWE.com said, could he be the first to lose it? Why would you post that? Shame on you. I'm glad Brian won. Because, A, nobody saw it coming. All of my friends insisted to me that Cody was going to win. Ha ha. And I'm happy, too, because a wrestler got it instead of a cutesy pie little sports entertainer. And I'm also happy because that little girl Heath didn't win. And I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm happy he won the briefcase. But WWE has a nice long history of fucking up with him, and I really hope that they're going to get this one instance right. I read the spoilers. He's holding off until WrestleMania before cashing it in. Please, just let the man have one WrestleMania moment. Please do not fuck this up. Do not NXT this poor man again. He's been through enough. Well, just because they said it doesn't mean they're going to do it. But let's bring on... Someone who did a interview with Daniel Bryan for our Best and Worst Technical Wrestler show the other year. So someone who's hung out with Daniel Bryan, Danielson, whatever you want to call him. And is featured, I might add, in the Wrestling Road Diaries, especially on the two-disc edition. Chris Harris, your thoughts on the American Dragon winning the Money in the Bank briefcase for SmackDown? This is a big reason of why I'm watching wrestling, and you know what a big Bryan fan I am. Mm-hmm. I think I believe my pick of wrestler of the decade. I love Brian so much to see him do this. I, last night I was coming home from work and I was talking to my girlfriend on the phone and I was like, oh, she said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to go home and watch wrestling, hop over a bag of Cheetos and drink some Mountain Dew just like high school. And she really Is that when she said, me. I'm no longer your girlfriend? <laughs> no, she rebuts to me, well, I'm not with you, so you're not getting laid. So I guess it really is like high school. <laughs> Yeah, wrestling fans aren't allowed to have significant others, Chris, don't you yeah. know? We're all fucking I'm, virgins on the internet. I know, exactly. I, I guess that's why I've been off the air so often. 
But I, I'm really proud of Brian because I've seen him come up to the Indies. I'm really, really excited. Even if he loses, if he's the first to lose, it will still make him look like a million bucks, which is more than he looked like for his entire WWE career. I think he's had a good run so far, but let's see what Will Vafides thinks of the results. I like surprises. That definitely surprised me. Sheamus definitely looked like the winner. Of course, that's what me and Will Brooks both thought. He looked really strong, though. I think Sheamus looked really good in this match. A lot of the bigger guys looked really good. Sin Cara looked good, even though he got taken out. Uh, and now we know why. Overall, I thought it was great. I think Daniel Bryan's going to have a great opportunity now. It puts him in the spotlight, and he's going to have that briefcase. Every time you see that briefcase now, you'll, you'll keep getting reminded that this guy is going to get a title shot, and everybody who's had that briefcase has won the belt. So this could be a good thing to come. <laughs> well, there's also a first time for everything. I don't know about you, Chris, but the thought of Mark Henry and Big Show on a pay-per-view in 2011... <laughs> I don't think that ever would occur to me. And wow, I just can't believe they still went through with it. It's just well, how it was 2011, it, the Attitude Era died 12 years ago or whatever, 10 years ago. Let's just get over this already. Was it at least watchable? No, no, it was not. This and the Divas match were not watchable to me. Okay, they then we'll skip the... it. <laughs> yep, <laughs> sounds good to me. So we'll move on to Raw's Money in the Bank, which featured Alberto Del Rio winning... Unmasking Rey Mysterio in the process seemed, at least on paper, more stacked name-wise. But let's see what you thought of that match and how it went down. Chris, your thoughts on the Raw Money in the Bank? I love Del Rio, and I was really hoping last night during this tournament that he would just walk out and just get counted out, and at the end just point to the to the Money in the Bank and just you know what's coming. Let Ray win the belt and just let him come out and cash in right away, win that belt, and then we have this feud going into SummerSlam. That was my hopes. It didn't happen, but it's still looking forward to it. You know Del Rio is going to win that belt. This has been building up all year long. It's bound to happen. I'm kind of glad that Alberto won. I would have liked it better if Evan Bourne won or if Kofi Kingston had won, but that's with Alberto... That's not happening. We all know that's not <laughs> happening. Well... He, they had an equal chance. With Alberto, they've pulled the rug out from under him so many times, so I'm kind of glad that he won. The match itself was really really just strange and kind of weird to watch. I did like that one visual, though, where all of the men were on the ladders, and the briefcase was just swinging and swinging and swinging, and they all stopped hitting each other and started trying to smack the case like, ooh, ooh, I got, I got. All right, well... Okay. There were some great moments of that match. I think Evan Bourne was definitely still a show with that one. He's trying to get rid of Jeff Hardy footage and trying to put Evan Bourne footage in there with ladders because he did a phenomenal move. I think the guys all trying to go for the briefcase was great because it shows that they're really trying to go for something. And the ending was one of the best finishes I've ever seen in a ladder match because all he did was take a mask off. That's all he did. And all the ladders just collapsed. Fun moment to watch. Even the Mrs. Fall even looked bad. It did look like he really hurt his foot or it really hurt his leg. But this money in the bank match was very, very good. I was very entertained by it. The right guy won. Kudos to all those guys in that match. Christian reclaimed the world heavyweight title by disqualification. And a lot of people have been saying that they like this because in Christian's heel turn, they show Randy Orton as a flawed character. His temper gets the best of him cost him the title, and he unleashed his vengeance afterwards and his beard. So what do you think about Randy Orton losing the title to Christian in this manner, Chris? I'm glad. Fuck Randy Orton. I'm so sick of this guy. It's been seven years now of trying to push him, and now he's finally catching on. I really don't give a shit about him anymore. I want to see a guy like Christian win. When he won that belt, I really felt like, okay, they're going to bring me back in. And then two days later, I read he loses the belt. Right away, fuck WWE. This is why I don't watch. And now it's been two days. Christian still has the belt, and I'm still interested. <laughs> You're going to keep someone days. like me interested. I said it on the show before. Christian was someone I never thought as a main eventer. He was always a top mid-card guy. But if you get a storyline with Christian going where I'm interested in watching, I will watch. He's somebody since the attitude of her. He's been a hard worker, and he deserved it. I think he deserved it way more than Edge ever did. And I'm kind of glad that Edge did retire so that Christian could finally get his spot. <laughs> That's what it took. Yeah, it finally took somebody getting a neck injury where he has to retire. Well, boo-hoo, sorry. <laughs> 
Wow. Corey, your thoughts on Christian winning the title but as a heel? I'm glad that Christian won the title. I have never been interested in Randy Orton in whatever capacity. I feel that it was wrong for them to even try taking the belt off of Christian back when they did. Circumstances aside, the right guy won in this instance. I could have done without the visual after the match when Randy tried to fuck up Christian and had his little temper tantrum, but I'm glad Christian won. He deserves that belt. Well, at least once again, the Spanish announce table defeats Randy Orton. (laughs) (laughs) Will? I'm fucking pissed, man. I lost five points because of that match. I'm really mad. (laughs) You really really thought that after like four matches that Randy Orton would win this? Not by a DQ, man. Come on. That's like, I was pissed. Christian sucks. Christian, you know, I mean, like, I I haven't really been watching, but from what I've seen, Christian pretty much said, I will do this to win the belt, and Randy Orton fell for it. It was the perfect trap. It was done that he fell for it, though. I mean, honestly, truly, if you really knew you were going to lose by disqualification, would you really low blow if the referee was looking right at you? Now, what would have been better if the referee just turned around in time to see Randy Orton do it, and then he got caught? That would be better. But the fact that he did it right in front of the referee was like, eh, it should have been a little bit more like Randy Orton was trying to sneak around and trying to get it. I was glad Christian run, and I liked how Randy got his heat back. The crowd chanted, do one more. He went back and did one more. So he gave the fans what he wanted, and I think people went home happy anyway. So, But I lost five points, so fuck Randy Orton. He pissed me off. He's my number one pick. 90s Aiden in our chat room said Abyss won the NWA title via DQ and no one was bitching then. I guess that was his victory over Sting. And let's move on to the main event because that's what everyone really wants to talk about. CM Punk defeating Cena for the WWE Championship. As pointed out on our news update, this not only makes CM Punk a Triple Crown champion, he is one of three men to win the WWE Championship, ECW Championship, and the former WCW Championship, the big gold belt. is It's known the World Heavyweight Championship now, Chris, but it was also his last contractual quote-unquote day. So it seems to me that they've probably got some sort of deal. I'm sure you know the whole deal with Glad where they got upset because he called someone a homo in Australia, and WWE made sure to say, but his contract is running out soon which doesn't mean at all that they're not going to bring him back at any point. You know those technicalities they love. So more than likely, by doing this, letting CM Punk be the hottest thing in wrestling, there's got to be some sort of deal in place for him to come back rather shortly or within a reasonable time frame. But the match itself, I felt, was WWE's best match this year. A really well-performed main event. Some fucking smart marks, when they're not gushing their pre-cum about how great this match was, said, well, there were some botches, but they really didn't take away from the match. So it goes down a quarter star, so it's four and three-quarter stars because of the botches. First of all, the botches weren't any worse than anything Punk has done before. He's always been sloppy, if you want to call it that. I don't think you should do high-flying moves very much. But as it was, it didn't take away from the match at all. They weren't match-killing. And the crowd, as I mentioned before during the call, it was a real big match atmosphere. What everyone's been saying is that this, to them, was better than WrestleMania. It felt more like WrestleMania than WrestleMania. And in that degree, they felt the show was better than WrestleMania. I've seen mostly overwhelmingly positive reviews on this pay-per-view. The only person who said it was thumbs down and sucked was Bill Treadway, who's contributed to our show. He's the only one that I've heard so far. So I want to hear what you thought about the result, the match, and the overall show, Chris. How did somebody give this a thumbs down? They were booking for us this entire pay-per-view. CM Punk is a guy that I loved his Ring of Honor run, and when he came to WWE, I really felt like, why should I get behind this guy? They're just going to ruin him. Now, granted, it took them five years to get to this point, but these last three weeks have been booked specifically for us. The fans that were jilted by Invasion and all the other bullshit that's gone on in the last ten years, they got me to come back. That should say a huge amount for WWE. Punk has done it. This is a phenomenal storyline. This ended the right way. This match was great. I don't know how anybody could dislike this match. The match was pretty good, but I think the ending outcome was the best. 
I loved each of the areas of the match where CM Punk had Cena in different submissions, and he just looks into the camera with a shitty grin on his face. And there was one area where he even had Cena in a partial headlock, and he looks in the camera and his eyes cross and his tongue comes out, and that was just hilarious to me. I can see where some people, like Bill, would have given a thumbs down to certain areas of the pay-per-view. There are some matches that could have been cut, like the Divas match we could all do without the piss break. And it does seem odd that for a pay-per-view of this caliber with so much hype going in, we only got six matches. There's plenty of room for other wrestlers to have had at least an opening card match. As for Punk's match, though, I liked the outcome because we all got a nice big swerve. I thought Punk was going to get screwed when I saw Johnny Ace Laurinaitis and Vince McMahon come out. You should have heard how quickly my lungs filled up at that moment because I was like, oh, please do not do another Montreal here. Punk wins. I clearly did not see that coming. And then afterwards, they tried to have Alberto Del Rio come out, and CM Punk just clocks him into next week with that foot, takes the belt, blows kisses, waves bye-byes, and up through the crowd. That was just incredible. So Daniel Bryan wins. John Cena, not now, but we thought at the time, quote, gets fired, and CM Punk wins the title. I'm pretty sure you probably orgasmed watching that, Corey. Uh, no comment, Eric. <laughs> but yes, I was quite pleased. Everyone's talking about CM Punk, though. When you're talking, Chris, about how they got you back, and I'm seeing so much that people are saying the same sort of thing, people within our demographic, some of the older fans, and you could hear just how passionate they were in that card. Don't you think that saying something akin to wrestling is hot again is wrong, though? Because Oh, completely. This is not wrestling is hot again. This is for... The hardcore fans, the ones that stuck through it, like you and I, who stuck through it through the, the worst years of the 90s, to have something to come back to. This is not for the Attitude Era of people that jumped on, on board on this bandwagon. CM Punk really spoke for us of about how this sucks. You have nothing but ass kissers on top. Cena gets fired. We all know he's going to be back again. He really spoke for people like us, I think. Okay, but that's not what I'm going for here with the wrestling is not hot again. What I mean is wrestling itself isn't hot again because if we, like you keep mentioning the Attitude Era, let's talk about the Monday Night War. If you look back at 1998, it's across the board. WCW's most profitable year ever. WWF turned things around and became huge. ECW grew. That's all of them. Wrestling isn't hot right now. WWE is. Yes, that's true. So nobody's talking about TNA, even though there is somewhat of a youth movement going on with that one pay-per-view. Let's see if well, not really, it. because then they give Sting a so new Joker gimmick Sting, that everybody well, gets into, and they Joker put the belt Sting right is. back on him. Yeah. <laughs> and Ring of Honor, I mean, they're not even on television anymore. So, yes, W and by the me, Raw as well. Nobody's yeah. talking about really SmackDown. Okay. Up until Christian wins the belt. But, yes, Raw is hot again. And then they go with last night. They don't even have Punk on the show, but 90% of the show last night was wrestling. Mm -hmm. So I can't complain. That's what I want to see. Even if these are not the biggest names in wrestling going today, you're seeing Miz and Mysterio, okay, these two are going to go for the finals. I'm satisfied with that. I'm very happy with that. Two guys that can go in the ring. I wanted to see, if I watch two hours of wrestling, take away, what, 40 minutes of commercial, you're left with an hour and 20 minutes. I'm going to get an hour of wrestling. I'm very happy with that. Schnugelkin said, in the chat room, people have been waiting for something hot within wrestling's own bubble. I guess that's more along the lines of what I'm saying. Maybe it's even more specific than just Raw, Chris. Maybe it was just CM Punk itself. I don't know. But, mm -hmm. uh, Will Vafidez, your thoughts on CM Punk's win, the match with Cena, which I thought was great, and Cena should get some credit for that, which people are overlooking, and the whole pay-per-view in general. What's good about this is that Will Brooks lost five points, so this was wonderful. I thought the ending was tremendous. You could feel it in you when you're, like, really attached to a match. This had that feeling like Undertaker matches do at WrestleMania. It, it had such a big feel. And John Cena, I'll give him credit, I didn't think he was going to go to knock out Johnny Ace. I thought that was actually going to go to happen. So it keeps his character doing the right thing. In the end, McMahon screwed Cena, basically. And Cena's going to get fired for it. How Punk came out and that crowd, I, I don't know, if it wasn't in Chicago, it might not have meant anything as much as it did. 
because I think that has a lot to do with it. Well, I think but Punk would have been over, but not that over. Not a, I mean, that New, was like... New York and Philly may have done it. That's yeah, about it. I can't remember the last time I heard a crowd cheer for something like that. It's like the guy that is, like, in charge of Chicago. Like, he's the guy of Chicago. That's how they made him look last night. He had his new T-shirt out, which looked great, which I thought was really nice. I think it was always sold there. So it was out within a couple of minutes. It was sold out. That's how you make somebody in pro wrestling. That's how you make someone look that important and that means something to the company. But what makes this even better is that he's not part of the company. And I'm sure there's some kind of agreement. I think he, on his Twitter, he was fucking around with it everywhere. There's something really good coming out of this. And I think that as wrestling fans, it definitely brings back some old school feeling and this show was as good as ECW One Night Stand of 05. That's a show I watch all the time and when this comes out on DVD, this is going to be a show I'm going to watch all the time because it was just so good. That's like the best match Best pay-per-view in a long time. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it because it seems like you didn't do too well on the Battle of the Wills results. So (laughs) you want to give us the points as it worked out after this pay-per-view? What's happened is Will Brooks won two matches. So he gets four points. However, he lost a match, so he lost five. So in the end, he has four points total. Now, as for me, we have to talk about that because I technically had three people on the pay-per-view, so I got points for that. I didn't win any matches, but I lost points, so I have negative two. Uh We have to – okay, thank you. But we have to talk about what happened before we actually aired it because everyone knows Mr. Anderson lost the title – the Heath Ledger. Yeah, black-haired Heath Ledger. Jim and, Carrey dressed uh, up as the Joker. <laughs> yes. The problem is, though, is that Battle of the Wills started at Money in the Bank, and this happened before it. So what I asked Eric to do is to come up with a decision, and you have to make that decision. It's got to count, Will. Sorry. Even though it's a pay-per-view-based thing, titles do change hands outside of pay-per-view, and everyone's expecting it. Yes. So I think and, it's got to count. No, 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 is we agreed to that, but... No, no, no. Three years behind on pop culture. Does anybody get this? Because the crow was, like, three years afterwards. Now Heath Ledger's Joker. Is, is there, like, something going on with Sting where he's three years behind our era? Yeah, he should have been Bane. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been perfect. Surprise In, like, nobody... three years, is he going to be Harry Potter or something? I don't get this guy. <laughs> oh, God, that would be perfect. Sting beat Anderson for the title, right? Yep. That means I get points because I have Sting on my team. Nah, actually, if you read the directions, it only counts when it's on a pay-per-view, if you read the directions correctly. So oh, it does not crap, count. Man. How can you lose points if the guy loses on, on impact or law, but you don't get points if the, if the guy wins oh, on impact you, you or signed, law? How does You sense? signed the contract, sir. I didn't sign shit. You didn't have anything to sign. Nice try. But no. No, I mean, no. How, you how, don't how, get... how do you lose points? And, but don't gain points for the same activity. How does that make sense? Dude, I made the directions, and that's what it is. And if you watch the YouTube video, it states that you have to win a title at a pay-per-view. It does not mean any time. Uh, you know what? Don't matter. I'm still going to kick your ass anyway. <laughs> well, let's keep up to date on WrestlingRoundTable.com about Battle of the Wills because we only have a few minutes left, and I want to move on to Raw because... It is just a good year, Chris, for WWE to fuck with the internet because, once again, much like the punk quote shoot promo, they're doing stuff that's making people question what's real and what's not. Because Raw ended last night with McMahon stopping the tournament final between Mysterio and Miz. McMahon doing an angle with Triple H where he quote stepped down and there was a lot of crying and whatever and people think this is real. Waltman said it's real, so it's got to be. What do you think about Everything how... on Twitter is real, Eric. <laughs> of course. So what do you think about how Raw went down the next night and the whole Triple H McMahon thing? I enjoy it. I really did. It captures a lot of that old feeling of Raw. Of like, It's a cliffhanger. It's like an episode of Lost or Battlestar Galactica where you want to tune in next week. Something that really they've lost in the last few years where I would just tune in, watch YouTube clips, and just be like, whatever, I don't give a shit. Read those recaps on on our website where I just don't care about Rob. But this actually makes me want to tune in because this really might be the end of of Vince's character, which is not really a bad thing. It, It may be his time is up. And it may be time for someone else like Triple H to step up. He's not in the ring anymore. It could be this time to to move on. He's off to a great start with Sin Cara. Oh, of course. <laughs> Him and Karma under the new talent initiative. Two for two so far. <laughs> One gets shot up with steroids and the other got shot up with semen. Oh, you beat me to it. <laughs> 
I think it's great that either Miz or uh, Rey Mysterio are going to win a title because that's even more points for me. I don't mind tournaments. I actually like tournaments a lot. I got really mad when they took the King of the Ring off the pay-per-view because I thought that was what used to be one of my favorite pay-per-views. But, um, no, I have no problem with them going for the vacant title. They're saving you money. They're giving it to you for free now. I know. It sucks, man. But it used to be a great way to, like, make new stars with King of the Ring. But, anyway. No, like I'm King gonna... Sheamus. And King Regal. Uh, I was going to say Mabel, too. You could you beat me, man. I don't mind the tournament at all. Just, like, the ending, though, was kind of... It was way too fucking long. And I love how Cena is, like, all talking about how... How can, you, how can you guys complain about it was too long? Because it was too long. Wrong. No, but the thing Eight is, like, what bothered me... Another... too long? What would you rather see? No, but I'm saying... It's with want... midgets and divas matches. Yeah, really, what do you guys want to see on Raw? This is, like, this is the problem. No, no, what do I you think, guys want to see? I didn't say it was bad. It's just that it ran a little long. That's no cap. I mean, it's not, not a horrible thing. You want to see more of a Triple H and Vince McMahon circle jerk? What is going on? The only thing that really bothered me about it was when uh, Cena like, was telling how Shawn Michaels bent over backwards for Vince McMahon all these years. I'm like, well, yeah, but not in a way like you were implying, Cena. You're getting butt-fucked because that's how you kept saying the job. But other than that, no, I was cool with it. Oh, please. We all know Michaels gives head. Corey? <laughs> yeah, that was kind of interesting watching Triple H and Vince McMahon just cry like, I'm sorry, Vince, but... You have been relieved of your duties. And nobody made a duty comment. That was kind of a surreal moment. The only thing I have really to complain about with the tournament, take out guys like Miz and Rey Mysterio that have already held the belt. Keep most of the guys that were there, like Kofi and R-Truth. They should have replaced the guys who've had the belt with people who haven't touched it before. But that's really just me nitpicking. That was a surreal image seeing Triple H and Vince McMahon just crying, discussing whether or not Vince had a job anymore. The corporate site has not updated, so I'm not buying it just yet. However, some people are saying that if they were to try and blur the line between storyline and who really owns the company, it could be an SEC violation. What do you guys think of that? People are reading into it way too much. I doubt McMahon's stepping down now at this age, and we only have about a minute or so left. So real quick, Will Vafides, your thoughts on Raw and the whole turnabout? It's a good way to extend the storyline. It's a lot of realism, and it continues to keep CM Punk in the spotlight, and it keeps the WWE title very, very important, which I don't think it's been that important for a long time. All right. Well, that's going to do it for Wrestling Roundtable Radio this time. We'll be back real soon talking about Strike Force, Fedor versus Hendo, Dan Henderson. That's coming up real soon. And, of course, more on pro wrestling. And you can keep up to date on Wrestling Roundtable. Follow us at Twitter, like us on Facebook, and sign up for our message board. You can also shop at our store. We have an Amazon store as well. You can get anything doesn't have to be wrestling or MMA related. You can get kitchen utensils and things like that. <laughs> Whatever's on Amazon.com, you can get it through our store. And I want to invite you once again to get the Wrestling Roundtable t-shirt. Get your Wrestling Roundtable t-shirt and wear it around to pro wrestling and MMA shows. So for the panel of Chris Harris, Will Brooks, Will Vafides, Coriander Ake, Rodney LeConte, thank you to all our callers. Join us next time, WrestlingRoundtable.com.